What is happening, everybody? I'm back. It's been a long time, I know. It's wild how that happens. I got insanely busy. I feel like I say that all the time, but it is the truth. I was fortunate enough to finally get a very hectic shooting schedule, and I had to jump on it. But we're back. New season. I've done that before. You know what I'm saying? Season seven? Season six. I think that's right. (laughs) Uh, Besides being busy, though, I said yes to a bunch of personal projects. You know, all the times that I promote on this show, really chasing after personal projects, doing the things you love. I said yes to a lot, a lot of things I didn't even have time to do. And I just thought, you know what, Rick, you got to practice what you preach here. So I've been filming some stuff on the side. I co-led a a retreat, which was pretty wild, but I missed this show. I missed you. Some of you were nice enough to email me and be like, where you been? I hope you're coming back. And it it really means a lot when you do that. Cause you always wonder like... Is anybody even going to miss this show? Does anyone out there care? And a few of you did, evidently. So, and maybe more of you, but a few of you took time to tell me that. And and I appreciate it. I really do. Because this show is one of those other personal projects. And it's at the top of my list. It really is. It's one of the things I enjoy doing the most. And even in this conversation you're about to listen to, that's the juggling act. How do you balance commerce and passion? Sometimes they intertwine. They really do. I, I love what I do for a living, to be clear. But there's so many things I love to do, including this podcast. And how do you prioritize that balance? How do I travel around with my family and yet be here to record? How do I take on photo shoots that were almost daily? And once again, very grateful for that and do this show. And that's what I'm working on. I might need to just take season breaks. I'm really starting to realize that kind of late summer through fall, probably not the best time for me to be trying to do this show, but I'm going to work it out. But here's the crazy part. I'm coming back after being off for a while, being out of practice, really, with an amazing guest, two guests. Ethan Hawke is here. I'm a huge fan of Ethan as an artist in general, as an actor, of course, but like he really has always represented to me someone just out there trying to live his most creative life. He has stepped into many creative spaces. And along with him, Steve Cousins returns. Steve's been on the show before. Check out that episode to hear his whole biographical story. But they just made a beautiful film, a biopic about Flannery O'Connor. You may or may not have studied Flannery in school, or maybe you're just a literary buff and you know who Flannery O'Connor is. But she was a courageous and beautiful author who lived a short life, which would be tough to make a biopic on. And that really is the beauty of what they did. They came together to create a story along with Ethan's daughter, Maya, who actually kind of brought brought the idea of doing a a movie about Flannery to Ethan, along with a host of other amazing actors. And they interwove the stories of Flannery into this movie just so seamlessly and so beautiful. I'm really becoming a fan of Steve as a cinematographer. He's so talented. He really knows how to compose a shot, how to color grade something beautifully. And we talk all about it. I mean, I was just so honored to to have Ethan on the show, to have Steve come back, of course, because I'm a fan of Steve. But to have someone like Ethan on my little show that I'm based out of the mountains of Colorado, uh, that is the beauty of technology. You know, I get to sit down with someone like that who I, I really respect as an artist and a creative and talk about the process as well as his philosophy around it all. So thank you both. Thank you, Steve, for helping me make it happen. It was great to have you back on as well. But I highly recommend seeing this movie. Support independent films. We need this in our life. I love blockbuster movies like anyone else, but I love when people try to make art on film and we need the public to say, yes, that's what we want. We want more of this. Spend some money on it. It costs money to make movies, a lot of money. And to make a period piece like this adds a whole nother level of cost. And the fact that they undertook this story is both impressive and inspiring to me. And uh, they did a beautiful job with it. It was a huge undertaking, I'm sure, because there's just not that much story there to tell a biopic. And so for me, the way they interwove the story to really try to give you some insight into the thought process and who Flannery was, was just beautifully done. 
And once again, it was just such an honor to talk to them and to be able to promote a film as beautiful as this, as well as the other films that Ethan and Steve have worked on together. I hope they continue to work together. They're making some great stuff. But mostly what happened in this conversation that I hoped would is Ethan had some inspiring things to say because he does that and he does it well. He's really not afraid to put himself out there as a thoughtful, compassionate, creative who loves what he does. And in a world where too many people are too quick to sneer at sincerity, like that's the cool thing to do. I just really appreciate people like Steve and Ethan. So thank you both. I think you're going to love this conversation. I sure did. I'll shut up. Take you right to it. Here's my talk with Ethan Hawk and Steve Cousins. All right, we're recording. Wow, that was, Woo! you know, I get Ethan Hawke to come on my show and everything falls apart. That's embarrassing. <laughs> Keeps you humble, eh? <laughs> oh, man. I'm already humble enough. I didn't need that. Jeez. What a way, <laughs> what a way to start the day. <laughs> All right, everything is working. Our audio is matched up. Great. Let me take a deep breath. Take a breath. Get the sweat off the brow. Oh, man. Steve Cousins, Ethan Hawk, welcome to the podcast. Thank you both so much for doing it. It's it's really an honor to have you both here. Hey, man. How you doing? Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. For those listening, I had a, a panicking situation where everything fell apart as uh, two people were waiting for audio. So we're back. Here we are. And, uh, you know, the first time we thought we were recording... I was telling Ethan that when Steve came on the show before and I, and I met him and we got a we had a nice conversation. He was here to promote HBO's Station 11 and, and we did talk about that show, but we ended up talking about the movie Blaze for a lot of the time at least because I was a big Blaze Foley fan. I think he's a, an amazing songwriter and I love that movie when it came out. I ended up watching it again with my wife just last night uh, after the Flannery movie. And uh, yeah, just such a beautiful movie, a, a tragic story, but you both did such a, an amazing job on, on telling that story and probably introducing a lot of the world to this figure that they, they weren't even aware of, but were probably aware of many of the songs. Well, you know, it's funny, um, Steve and I have an interesting relationship because we, we met when I was acting for Steve. Steve was shooting uh, a movie called Born to be Blue, where I played Chet Baker. And strangely, we now have a trilogy of biopics, which is really surprising to me. We did Chet Baker, Blaze Foley, and Flannery O'Connor. And I would have never thought that I would ever make three biopics in my life because I can't stand that genre. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and yet uh, we find ourselves doing it. And on all three of them, we've tried to go about it in at least aspire to an original way. You know, there was something wonderful about the Chet Baker piece because it, it wasn't, I think when I say I don't like the genre of biopics, what I mean is I hate the cradle to grave biopics, right? right? I really enjoy like one of my favorite movies of all time. I think the greatest biopic ever made is Raging Bull. And because it functions as a film, you can either know who Jake LaMotta is or not. And on the Flannery project, the Blaze Foley project and the Chet project, we really wanted them all to function as stories that are just human stories and using these actual real people as a jumping off place to have a conversation with the audience about different subjects. You know, Blaze, for example, to me was always about the two different wells of creativity. The one well of falling in love and tree houses and birds and squirrels and that beautiful feeling of nature and 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 the power of that of creativity that can come from feeling really good. And the other well, which is setting yourself on fire and hurting yourself, and that both of those can create substantive, meaningful art. And it's a, a mystery for those of us involved in it about where does creativity come from? You know, the Chet piece was all about second acts and recreating yourself. And, you know, that we focused on this one tiny period of Chet's life where he lost his teeth and had to rebuild his career. And the kind of fascinating thing about that is, is he kind of had to get sober to rebuild his career. And then once he had it again, all he really wanted to be was high. It's kind of really tragic that way. And then with the Flannery piece, we really just use her as a springboard for a meditation on the intersection between human creativity and, um, and faith. Mm -hmm. 
and we kind of use her life as a launching pad for that conversation. So the three movies are so different, but I think Steve and I have had a wonderful time exploring this idea of telling a story about an individual. Yeah, when Ethan, during uh, Born to be Blue, Ethan and I, you know, it was, I think it was all handheld, that film. And, you know, Ethan and I were often talking to each other, especially because, you know, when you're shooting handheld, it's often a dance with the actors and, you know, you're always moving and talking about how you're going to move. And I think Ethan and I really realized that we were speaking a similar language in some ways, you know, and then in Blaze, with working with Ethan as a director, we kind of, you know, took it up a notch and we started to kind of understand each other more and what our likes were and, you know, our influences. And we really realized how many things we had in common. And it was so effortless in a way to just step into moving, uh, you know, side by side with each other. So I was so excited to move into Wildcat because I knew that, again, we were going to just, you know, take it up a level and, and uh, you know, just have a great collaboration, which we did. It really has been. It's It's been such an inspiring collaboration in my life because Steve's not just a great photographer, but he's a brilliant storyteller. And how do you use the language of cinema to provoke feeling? And we, we're both extremely interested in, in the form of cinema and how to break it, how to try to do something original. You know, and, and the way to be original is to be completely yourself, right? You don't have to try to be original. We just have to be ourselves. And use our education and our emotional life. Steve said the greatest thing to me on, on Blaze, which I really loved, which is like, let's not talk about any other movies. Let's talk about how we feel. I like that. Um, which we kind of did on Wildcat too. Like we didn't really talk about other films. I sent you pictures of paintings and stuff like that. But for the most part, we were really just moving intuitively and not referencing a lot of, films it was so exciting to do that because steve would stay over at my house we were shooting in kentucky and i would just read him excerpts from flannery's journals and different things she wrote and different letters and was like we have to get at this idea right. how would we get at this idea and we'd location scout together you know the the funny thing about movies is so much of them gets made when you're location scouting because you're doing these long drives obsessed with the movie and obsessed with the script and how could that be better how could that be better and then you you find this location and the location starts to talk to your imagination and you start to together find out how you would shoot it. And because I come from an acting background, I'm always thinking about how the actors are going to integrate with the environment too. And so I, I find that process with Steve, it really exciting. I was curious, like, you know, because I know you've had a long working relationship with Linkletter coming together to create, a bunch of movies. And I was curious on like, because I knew the Chet movie as well. And so I, I did wonder, like, as you two have worked together, you know, like, did you learn something working with Richard Linkletter that uh, allowed you to kind of come together with a partnership to continue to work on movies like that and really kind of form a language together? Yeah. Well, one of the things you learn by working with really good filmmakers is that there's not one way to make a movie. I mean, Alfonso Caron and Richard Linkletter and Sidney Lumet and Peter Weir, Antoine Fuqua, they're all so different. And they approach the whole process so differently. And they all can be wildly successful. And you really start to realize that it becomes your job to find your movie. Right. It's not like I learned from Rick what the best lens is. Rick is a very, he's a, a style that's completely his own. And I often can, I know exactly how Rick would shoot a certain scene or I could read a scene and go, Rick would hate this scene. Because we've, I think we've worked together nine times now. So I, I know exactly how the guy thinks. And Before Sunrise was an incredibly pivotal movie in my life because I met a peer who was more obsessed with movies than I was. You know, I mean, his cinematic education is staggering and thrilling to be near. It's not like he's seen all of Bergman and all of Fassbender and all of this Iranian film directors. He's seen them all three times. Mm -hmm. And he loves movies and he loves the way the form demands to constantly change. And he's been a great ally and a friend to have. As the world watches more and more television, and, you know, we've watched in our lifetime big business kind of eat the art of cinema. It's such a wonderful art form and it's so relaxing and enjoyable to watch that people have learned they can make a lot of money off of it. But 
Rick's really inspiring about, you know, that society's not really a reliable critic and that what we need from our community of artisans and craftspeople and is to constantly explore this moment. Right. You know, lots of movies have been made, but no movies have ever been made today before with all the influences we have, all the things that are happening right at this moment. And, and this moment that we're alive in is really exciting as technology changes and obviously the ways that things are distributed changes. It's all impacting all of us. And we have a responsibility to push each other, push the form, to give audiences something unique that can speak to our time. So I, I've learned tremendous amounts from him. And, you know, he's the first person I showed the first cut of Wildcat to. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, he's wonderful because he just doesn't think like anybody else. Totally. You know? Yeah. I mean, the reason I bring him up, I think, is because, I, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of his in general, but Boyhood, which you were also a, a part of, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Maybe. I mean, I, I really love that movie. I have a son who's getting older now. He's, he's almost 19, but you both, and, and I'm assuming he avoided a lot of the obvious direction. If you were just trying to make money with the film, you know? And, and I think when I watch blaze and when I watch wildcat, it, it seems like you said, you're, you're really trying to be true to your voice as an artist and tell a story and not kind of have your arm twisted into making some cinematic choices that would push it to more of a mainstream audience. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, like I, I think oh, it, it makes, com it makes complete sense. And that's part of what's so important. I don't think people who love movies fully understand the depth of the collaborative process. One of the things that makes filmmaking so exciting is it, it really is a collage art form and you kind of lead actor and your cinematographer are like your left and right arm and their impact on the art of storytelling there on the movie is, is so powerful and who you choose to surround yourself by is the biggest thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and even for example, in a, in a movie like blaze, part of why I needed Steve so bad is that Steve is extremely effective at putting actors at ease. And I knew that with Charlie Sex, I was had two musicians as the lead actors, and I knew that self-consciousness was going to be our enemy. And he did the same thing with Maya. You know, when you have a 24-year-old star of your film, you really want to give that performer permission to collaborate mm -hmm. and to be an artist and not tell them to pose and not tell them to deliver the line this way. We want to photograph life and we want characters to exist in the frame and, and Steve is so good at maintaining his own integrity while inviting other people to collaborate. And, and that's what I try to do, too, is, I mean, actually, I found a better answer. The thing that Linkletter does that is so special is invite others to collaborate. If you made Boyhood with a different lead actress than Patricia Arquette, that movie would be an entirely different film. It's, it's such, and the same with me and the same with his DP, he really is so confident that he invites in other people's creativity and trusts that the team will rise higher than the individual would have. Right. You know, there are certain directors that love to put their signature on every frame and, and there can be a great value of that. And that can be kind of exciting. It's not much fun to work on. Right. Uh, yeah, I was going <laughs> to, sure. I was going to say like, I think, you know, the thing that, you know, working with you, Ethan, uh, we, we've talked to, about this a lot is that, you know, uh, while well, Ethan's really open to the collaboration and really trusting and, you know, as a DP, you don't, you don't always get that. And it's not nearly as fun when the director is, you know, has kind of a very linear approach and kind of preconceived something that doesn't always allow you to bring your best, your best self to, to the game, you know, and with Ethan, it's always, I, I, I always compare it to jazz really the way that we work because, you know, we, we have a framework and then once we get inside that we really allow each other to kind of go any direction including the actors and i think that's where you know you let the life in you know and i think that's something that we both aspire to you know that kind of process i think it comes through i mean look compositionally it's 
They're both beautiful films. I mean, that the slow mo shot and blaze of the wedding, you know, that was yeah, that, that was entirely Steve's idea. That was gorgeous. It's, it's I mean, such I, a phenomenal it's funny. Shot. Like, I, f- I think I forgot about that shot. And like I said, we watched it again last night and I was like, oh, yeah, this. This shot's beautiful, you know, just because it it just keeps going too, you know. Well, that, well, that was that was so fun because we knew it was going to be such a long shot, and so it was so fun. Eh? You think to create like all the wardrobe and where everybody was and the colors and how you know the kid on the swing yeah, when the he'd swing. come in, uh-huh. and, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was so nice to know that that was going to last, and you know. Yeah, it's beautiful. And the the color grading, all of it. I mean, it's just really beautiful film. I don't want to talk about Blaze the whole time, even though I, I do love that movie, because Wildcat, it also, it, it just turned out really well. You know, I'm familiar enough with Flannery. I mean, I, I read her in, in high school. And what was really kind of crazy about the film is my son was a senior last year, and he had... Uh, AP Lit, and they were doing Flannery. He read uh, The Life You Save May Be Your Own, which obviously is, it comes up in the movie, you know? I mean, it, this this beautiful weaving of Flannery's life with Flannery's characters and kind of this arc of a little bit of the characters are obviously a part of you. And, you know, that's all this, you know, it, it, it all comes together. But uh, seeing that story interwoven i was like oh i literally just read this one with my son last year you know and it was, so it was pretty fresh and even some of the dialogue that popped up you know i remembered and yeah it was it was really cool what a what a cool approach on you know how to tell a fairly short life story but no shortage of of uh, character information i guess she has this line that i love that is kind of the heart of the movie which is that she said, I, I never completely lose myself unless I'm writing, and I never completely find myself unless I'm writing. In this, this kind of paradox of losing the ego and disappearing, which is often how I feel as an actor. You know, when you spend your life as an actor, there's a lot of celebration of the self that happens around it. Oh, she's so neat. He's so amazing. I love his smile. But, but when you're doing it well, it's almost like you disappear. Right. That's what, it, what, when it feels, when it feels really good, when Steve and I were doing the Chet movie, you know, there's just these tiny moments where spontaneity happens, where you're honestly moved by something that you didn't expect to be moved by. And Steve's there photographing it and, and you get life on screen. And once you, when you have those little feelings, you go hunting after them because it's, it's a high. And so I, I felt that when we were approaching Flannery, I said, wow, this, this woman had a, mortal diagnosis at the age of 24. She barely left her house after that. Where's the movie here? I was like, the movie's in her imagination. The movie is, is her finding herself through her creativity. And, you know, the, the, how, how you find yourself by losing yourself and how, how fascinating that process is. And that in that way, her faith led her to her art, which led her to herself which is, you know, the God in each of us and the kingdom of God is inside you. You know, those are that she actually doesn't need anything right. to grow and to live, that she has everything she needs already. And that's a challenging thing to try to make a movie about. But it was incredibly fun to try. That was the first thing when Ethan sent me the script. He was like, you know, I got this idea. I'm uh, thinking of, you know, intertwining these short stories and, you know, trying to kind of fuse it with her life and, you know, read it and tell me what you think. And right away, that was, that's what excited me so much, actually, is that idea of really trying to find how all those threads of her short stories kind of fit into her life. And it's what we talked about the most, Ethan, like how we separate those, how we, you know, find that fuzzy, soft line of where they, where one starts and another ends. And, you know, that was pretty much like, a lot of the conversation. Oh, it's so cool. I mean, even with that story, the way, you know, she's in the, the train station and she sees the guy across from her with one arm and it just kind of is this transition period into that story. You know, I was, I remembered Parker's back pretty well, that story and, and seeing that come in. But yeah, I mean, like you said, Ethan, it, it, as far as a bio goes, it's it's not a very lengthy one, but then once you take this liberty of introducing all her stories and that, like you said, that kind of understanding that 
those stories were obviously a, a part of her as well and her own struggles with identity and her own struggles with her longing to be a successful writer, but also can that exist with her faith as well? You know, and I listened to an interview with you recently and Maya, and you talked about kind of your, you know, hitting your fifties and, and kind of wondering why you hadn't really, I guess, dug into your own spiritual seeking and, you know, like why it had been so important to you at a young age. And, you know, you felt like you left it behind, but then this realization of like, Oh, I've just been manifesting this through the arts you know, I feel like you even, that story even existed within Wildcat a bit. You know, I feel like she kind of comes to the same realization. It's exactly, I mean, that I like personal filmmaking and, uh, you know, that's kind of, for a lot of us who spend our life dedicated to movies, that is our faith, right? Like that's how we express our love of humanity, how we explore what's happened to us is through making movies about it. And it can be kind of thrilling what was dangerous about the movie and I think difficult for the audience is the central thesis of the movie is, is really that imagination is real. And if our imagination is real, you know, what happens, there's nothing that exists in our life, right. That didn't happen in somebody's head first, right. you know, whether it's this computer or the light bulbs or the table or, you know, the violence in the world, that violence started in people's minds long before it actually is manifest. And so the thesis of the movie is imagination is real. You can heal yourself or you can hurt yourself by what's happening inside you. The trouble with that is once you realize that's the math equation, you can't, Steve and I were forced in a position, if we made her imagination too distinct and different from what was really happening to her, mm -hmm. we would break our math equation. We, right. would, we, would actually, <laughs> right. we would actually ruin the point of the film so it, it invites the audience into a very sophisticated conversation because it's not super clear when you're in her imagination and when you're not and how they connect the same way it is in life. Um, I, I find that really exciting. And I think when you compare the two films like Blaze, there's something very accessible about Blaze Foley. He wears his heart on his sleeve. His songs are in his life. And, and Flannery is a much harder, prickly dangerous person in a, in a lot of ways, um, which made this one, the challenge to Steve and I was so high. I think we really got turned on, you know, like when you study short stories, for example, the discipline in the architecture of how to tell a story in 10 pages that can change your life. I would meet people. We were trying to get permission to shoot in these Catholic churches in Kentucky. And I met this amazing bishop who started laughing with me, reciting lines from stories of hers that he read 30 years ago that were written 60 years ago. And when somebody can write art that penetrates time like that, yeah, where you're sitting there laughing about a line that somebody wrote ages ago, it's so beautiful, but it's very difficult to do. You have to be razor sharp. And so the challenge to Steve and I was, uh, was intense. I, think I, I mean, I found myself chuckling multiple times in the dialogue there, especially like you said, her kind of prickly responses, you know, to a lot of yeah. what she was surrounded by, but I didn't mean to cut you off, Steve, go ahead. Oh no, I think it just, we felt from the beginning that there needed to be some separation between, you know, the, the short stories and the story of her life, but we didn't want it to be so obvious that it would be jumpy, you know, cause you see that in some films that are trying to jump across time like that. And uh, it, it can always feel so clunky. And so we, we really erred on being very subtle about it. And really the, the main difference was that the, uh, the short stories were shot mostly handheld and her uh, story was shot a little more classical mm -hmm. and a little more austere, which kind of worked for her. And then in the, in post, I, I graded them the, the two different kind of arcs, the story arcs and, and the, the short, the short story arcs and her arc. I graded them just ever so slightly differently, a bit more contrasty. But um, we really want to try to keep that line really uh, subtle, you know? The gra I mean, once again, just like I said with Blaze, the grading is gorgeous. What's it like working on a <clears> – <throat> I actually grew up in Kentucky. I'm in Colorado and have been for a very long time. But what's it like trying to create a period piece like that, you know, in Louisville's not – it's not like it's, you know, stuck in some time warp. It's it's a fairly uh, modern city these days. So, you know, like it's, when you were location scouting and doing all this, you know, like what is that preparation kind of feel like 
to think, all right, this has got to be said in this time period. You know, obviously you're going to bring in the team and the collaborative experience of wardrobe and everything to help create that aesthetic, but it's got to be a big undertaking. It's huge. And, you know, one of the things when we did Blaze, we're in the 70s and 80s, you know, 78 to 83 or something like that. Most of the movie is and. The jump to 1950 is a huge jump. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, uh-huh. I, it, 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 it's so hard to bring an audience back in time. And that's why I really talked about the location scouts, because the only way that we could make Louisville, Georgia in 1950 is by driving and driving and driving. And the, the crew uh, was incredibly patient because, you know, many days began and ended with a two hour drive. We just had to get away from all the Wendy's. We had to get away from the airplanes. And it's funny because when I was a kid, I felt like all those old farmhouses and things like that, I felt like they were, they were going to be everywhere. Didn't you, Steve? And, mm-hmm. and yeah. as time marches on, you realize, oh, right, it's 2023. This stuff, yeah. it's hard to find. We were so lucky to find Flannery's house, this, the, the farmhouse that we found that was perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And when, once we found that, I knew the film was makeable. But still, Ethan had done so much driving around by the time I got there. So I, in a way, I was treated because when I arrived, you had some amazing locations. Like that first couple of days that you were showing me some of the places you had found, I was already like so psyched. I was like, okay, this is amazing. You know, this 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 is it. This is the film, you know, and you would just put on so many hours driving around. So oh, yeah. Hours. my that, One of the great things about having your wife be your producer is we just our kids went to camp, you know, in a summer camp. And we spent two weeks in the summer but before we agreed to make the movie there, just dri- driving around. And I, I would send Steve pictures. And I was like, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. Um, but, you know, it's funny getting a chance to talk publicly with Steve is so fun for me because I've realized recently that what a huge impact Dennis Hopper had on me. You know, people are always citing these important filmmakers. And I was so happy the other day, my son who's 21 called me up and said, dad, have you seen easy rider? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, it's, I always thought, you know, it was just some kind of corny sixties relic. Said, That's a great film. And it is a great film. It actually is. It's, it's an amazing film. And, and one of Dennis Hopper's secret powers was his great love of photography. He was always championing other artists and uh, he was a great photographer himself, but he really loved photography. And so do I. And one of the things that pleases me to know him on both Blaze and uh, Wildcat, they were so much fun to edit because the level of photography that I was looking at every day was so thrilling. Everything that Steve touches, he can make anything a beautiful shot. The way that you see poetry in daily life and the way you're allergic to an ordinary frame is so thrilling and it, it made it so fun to shoot. And the challenge and discipline of the period was like, okay, Hey, we've got this train station. We can shoot here as long as we only look this direction. Oh, sure. All right. How can we, how can we make this thrilling to look at? And Steve would always figure out a way. Well, and, again, like sometimes, sometimes like for example, on a TV series, you show up at a location and, Everything has been done. All the money has been spent to shoot 360, and oftentimes you don't. And, you know, on this film, we knew that we had this, these little narrow gaps, and we never had the money to look anywhere else. And to Ethan's credit, he was all, always open to going, okay, like, let's shoot this little gap here, and, and, you know, let's do something interesting and, you know, make it beautiful. And, make it beautiful. and this is, if this is all we can do in the shot, then so be it, you know? And not not fight that we couldn't look, you know, 360 well, in a lot of these places, you know. It's it's one of the benefits of a theater training is you learn a lot about blocking, about how to move actors and create dynamics on a boring stage. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the directors that I work for as an actor, they don't understand staging and that we don't you don't have to cover a scene in some normal way. Um, you don't need to turn around on that actor. Working with Sidney Lament, one of his great strengths was he really understood staging. Oftentimes, he'd play whole scenes in one shot, but it's not like a shot that even draws attention to itself. It's, it's a shot that becomes dynamic because this actor comes foreground, then they turn around, they're off screen. This one steps back, turns their back to camera. That's arresting. Now the camera pushes in. Then they, you know, 
it, there's so many ways to create cinema. And the easiest way is to be 360 and just shoot whenever anybody's talking. And it, it was really fun, Steve. Uh, I got a call the other day from the actor Steve Zahn, who's, who's in the movie. And because Steve and I have spent our life in acting, right, you know, we often will show up on set, rehearse a scene, and it's so boring because you know exactly how the director and DP are going to shoot it. This way, that way, that way. And it just, it makes for a boring movie. To, if it's boring on set, you can be sure it's going to be boring to watch, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and Steve is so proud of us because he's so informed about the process of filmmaking that he noticed like when we cover a scene, it has real energy and power because we haven't overdone it. And he's like, he called to say like the reason why that scene with Liam Neeson works so well is because you're not covering every scene like that. You're only covering that scene like yeah. that. And so it, it makes the movie different in this scene, even though nothing dramatic is happening, the editing and the coverage of it is so different that it, it seems activated in a way because we haven't overused that muscle. You don't overuse the close up. Peter Weir mm -hmm. was always when I did Dead Poets Society, he was always saying that no movie should have more than three close ups. It's the most powerful tool that cinema has. And when you overuse it with this constant coverage, um, yeah, the audience is kind of like it because it's like candy, but the whole thing is diminished. Well, I find I find often there's not enough restraint. Again, I'm comparing to working often in television because it's a different speed and you know it's just a different beast but there's there's less of a, a restraint and i often find that there are shots that you do just because you can not because you should you know and it's something something that ethan and i were always talking about is just having a certain amount of rigor in the way that we shot it you know and not be we didn't need to be wasteful you know like if this is if this is what communicated the idea then that's all we need you know and i think with modern television and, and TV making, that's kind of been lost. You always do so much coverage and it's very common also to just be doing, you know, one shot is on a Zoom and the next shot is on a Steadicam. And instead of, you know, sticking to a certain amount of, um, you know, simple parameters, you know, to tell Giving tell yourself a specific simply. vocabulary to use. One of the things that breaks my heart making independent movies is deleted scenes. People love this idea of like, oh, they cut that scene. And every time on a lower budget movie that a scene isn't in the final movie, it was a, an error in planning because, you know, like, for example, I'm really happy with Born to be Blue with that Chet movie, but it always kind of broke my heart when I'm playing in Birdland at the end of it. There should be 250 people in there, right? But we can't afford 250 people. But... Had we not shot those three days of the scenes that we cut out, we could have afforded 250 people in there. <laughs> sure, y yeah. You know? And and that's another thing that I learned from Linkletter is like, no deleted scenes. We don't have the money for deleted scenes. Let's rehearse. Let's talk. Let's work on this. Let's figure out what we're trying to say and say it and put our money on the shots that are going to be in the movie. Then you find you have plenty of time to shoot the film. Well, and it seems like Steve approaches, you know, for someone like myself who comes from the world of still photography, and even though I've moved over into a lot of motion work and directing commercial stuff, my whole upbringing is around taking still photos. And I feel like Steve seems to uh, approach a lot of scenes from that vantage point of like, how do I frame this compositionally to where, you know, less says a lot more. It's all in there. You know, everything's happening mm -hmm. without, like you said, mm -hmm. getting, getting too many cutaway shots, bouncing back and forth between two, two mm -hmm. different focal lengths, whatever it may be. Yeah. Well, again, you know, Ethan and I, we had time to go to these locations and really look at, you know, what our angles were going to be and to keep it simple and not overshoot it and talk about how to just elegantly do it. Really? Yeah. Like I said, I mean, it turned out beautifully. You brought up Liam Neeson just a second ago. And that was another thing with Blaze and this one, these, these like small kind of bit parts where you suddenly wait, like, oh, it's Liam. He's the the priest or Sam Rockwell coming in, you know, in the, in the Blaze movie where you're like, wait, is that Sam Rockwell? Is the sunglasses on, you know? And what does that look like for, you know, actors like that, especially in, in the independent film world I, I guess what does that pitch look like and, and did, is that someone you thought of is that someone you thought I want Liam Neeson to be the priest I knew that that 
scene needed to be the beating heart of the whole film. Mm -hmm. And so it needed to be, it needed a special power. And for the church, the discipline of the church was extremely important to Flannery's mysticism. And uh, she gained a lot of power and confidence through the discipline of her faith. And she was also very critical of the church and she saw it with clear eyes, but she loved it. And so I, I knew I needed an actor who could make it feel important Yeah, to kind of capture the humor and the subtlety of it, but also not make fun of, you know, a lot of times in movies, particularly you either have proselytizing movies, right? Movies that are trying to sing to the choir, right? Or you make fun of the church, you know, priests are bad guys in movies and they do diabolical bad things. And there isn't a humanness attached that they're just people. People have dedicated their life to a faith and some of them are really amazing and some of them are fraudulent. But for Flannery, her faith was extremely important and I needed an actor that could deliver the line, joy is sorrow overcome. Beautiful you line, know, yeah. And, in, in, in a way that would land for the audience to understand that, wait, it is really bad. She is going to die. This is going to kill her. And that's life. And you can still have joy. Bad things happen all the time. And it, it's the way that nature grows is through death and new life and inside of us and outside of us. And I needed that theme to give Flannery the power to go on, you know? And so I needed... I needed a really wonderful actor. And I, for some reason, you know, through the years, of, uh, I, I knew Liam's, Liam's wife, Natasha Richardson, was in my first film. And she, loved, she, was, a belief, she was one of my early fans. And it, it meant a lot to me. I, I laughed saying it because one of the things that Natasha was amazing at was loving art. You know, her mother's Vanessa Redgrave. Her father's Tony Richardson. And she had a passionate love of art. And... She met me when I was young and she really believed in me. And, and Liam has been good to me my whole life because of that. And I just called him up and said, Hey, do you want to do one scene? And it'll be, I promise it'll be the most important scene in the movie. You'll be glad you did it. And he said, I need one U.S. dollar. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah i mean it's a, it's a beautiful scene it's funny because I, I did I, like i have a few notes in front of me and and one of the notes is joy is sorrow overcome. I wrote it down when I was watching the movie because it is a beautiful line. It's a beautiful scene. And it really kind of a scene where he also, you know, kind of when I was talking about your own story and your own kind of realization of, I guess, manifesting um, your spiritual journey through the arts, he kind of gives her permission in that scene, you know, to do the same. And it, yeah, it's a really, it's a powerful scene for sure. Yeah. It's the heart of the movie. And that's wonderful that you wrote that line down. It means it worked. Yeah. It, yeah. It was, it was beautiful. I do want to just really quickly touch on because you, you brought your kids up and I know that Maya is the one that really kind of brought this, this story to life at first. And, um, you know, it's gotta be a cool feeling as if I, like I said, I'm a father of two kids that are growing up way too fast for me. And you have those moments, you know, you were mentioning your son watching easy rider. Like I, I have so many of those moments where my son gets really into Radiohead or something from the nineties that I grew up with. And I'm like, yes, of course I know this. Let's, let's talk about it. But to have her obviously like having her own success, but, and then, you know, to get into this and bring you this story, it, it had to be a, a pretty cool feeling to to be able to collaborate like that and 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 build a story together. I don't know if it would be such a great thing if she wasn't so gifted. She's such an interesting person. Mm -hmm. I mean, she always did things on set that surprised me. And I never, when we were working together, I never really even thought of her as my daughter. I, I thought her as this really wonderful artist that was, she had a passion to play this character. And, you know, I pitched around the same time I told Steve the idea of like, well, what if we made a movie about creativity? Like, what if we used Flannery? Like, Maya was just completely game with that. I mean, it was really, you know, I asked Maya and Laura to play all these different aspects of the same person you know, with these different wardrobes. And I, I wanted that to be fun, but I also didn't want it to be a stun. I wanted it to feel still emotional and, and vibrate with something authentic. And they both completely threw themselves at it. In a lot of ways, Steve and I trusted them to make the difference between imagination and reality come alive for us. And that, that was it. very exciting 
<laughs> yeah, I gotta say that was, you know, for me, uh, I have an 11 year old daughter and just to, to daily be on set to see Ethan and Maya relating to each other creatively and to feel the closeness and to, I, you know, I was always imagining, oh my God, it'd be so amazing to be able, you know, when Eva, my, if my, when my child grows up to have a, you know, collaboration that's so meaningful like that, you know, so to be in that daily was really special and it was always heartwarming for sure. Well, I love that you said, Ethan, how do we make a movie about creativity? Because, you know, Eva, you did the TED piece however long ago that, that was where it was, yeah, you know, it was during really, the pandemic. Yeah. Yes, it, it was beautiful. And, you know, look, it, I know clips of it have become, you know, viral memes a lot of, of the times because it, I think it was just this, you know, that whole idea of like, just give yourself permission, you know, to, to really follow your creative impulses. I've always been a big fan too. And, and I think you and a lot of your contemporaries that you came up with, even obviously River before he died, but a lot of that scene was like, it felt like you never let anyone convince you to just be one thing. And so it was always music and poetry and writing and film. And, and I just, I've, I'm such a fan of it. It comes up on this show all the time because especially in the world of photography and stuff, and especially in the world of commercial photography, you can have a lot of people in your ear just being like, look, just stay in your lane. This lane is good for you. You know, like that's how you get paid. And they're not wrong, but it's a real quick way to lose the passion and burn. It happened to me. It literally happened to me. And this show evolved from me burning out from just staying in my lane and trying to get good paychecks, even though I was interested in all of the arts and always have been. And so I just, I really appreciated that that talk. And like I said, when I, when you look at kind of the arc of your career, you've held true to it, you know, you've, you've made, you've done well, you know, but you've also, it seems like you've also, you know, always really with films like this and with working with people like Steve, you, you've really focused on how do we showcase creativity and not just make a box office movie. It's, it's how do we stay alive? Right. I mean, how do we stay awake and conscious and, um, curious and excited to be alive and money and pursuit of accumulation of wealth and status and things that society tends to celebrate. It's so short lived. And when you can feel yourself on a journey of learning, you know, one of the things that Steve was just saying to me before we got on this that I really appreciate is this notion that, you know, I'm kind of an old actor now, but I'm a young filmmaker. And you have to let yourself learn. You have to keep letting yourself learn. If you're not doing that, you're not growing. You know? And there's a time, you know, when like you, like Steve, we all do it. Sometimes you work to pay your bills and you just have to do it. Um, and you have to be a craftsman and you have to be smart about it. And you have to bring your best self and bring everything you learn and be worth that money that you're getting. And that's the only way that keeps your self-esteem up is to actually do your best in any environment. But there's also a time and a place that you need to make space for yourself to grow and to push yourself into avenues where you're not sure what to do. And it's thrilling to do that. Obviously, you risk falling on your ass. <laughs> sure. You, you know, but falling on your ass is not that bad. You, you get up and, and you do it again and, and you're the wiser for it. I think probably because I was successful young, I was really dubious and... Um, Scared of success, I saw all these artists that were better than me around me that weren't getting paid a lot of money. I, I understood the kind of fraudulence of perceived success, and it certainly doesn't accumulate into a meaningful life. And we live in a culture that if the world can't see that you're trying to make money, they are dubious of you. That's what they mean when they stay in your lane. Like, I, I want to know what your motivations are. Right, totally. You know, and if, if your motivations are your own growth and development, people roll their eyes and think you're corny or society has a kind of allergy to sincerity. It's just not cool. And yet, if you spend your whole life being insincere or, or working for money, it, it's, it's deadening. And so you kind of have to just continually shake it off. And working with challenging people and people who challenge you and on material that is challenging does it. You got anything to add to that, Steve? In terms of like living a creative life, you know, like as a DP, how I relate to that is just, you know, you aren't always given trust in order to flex your, your abilities and to, you know, bring as much of your person to a project, you know, and I would say that, you know, my collaboration with Ethan has 
been that where we can just be really open and inspire each other. And, you know, it's, that's as, it's as good as it gets really. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I love what you said, Ethan, as far as that willingness to fall down, you know, I mean, I'm, I have just become such a, a big proponent and implement it into my own life of that kind of beginner's mind, childlike wonderment, wherever I can just push myself to, to take on something new, to be bad at something, to be a beginner at something. I just think, you know, I'm, as I get older, the same thing, you know, I, I'm, I want to be like, you were calling yourself a new filmmaker like that. I'm always looking for that. And I've really, I think through this show, honestly, have really gotten better at challenging myself to take on whether it's creative aspects of my life or just personal aspects that are really challenging and force me to be a beginner. And in the creative space, sometimes with no expectation of anyone ever seeing it, just trying to make for the sake of making. Play for the sake of playing, you know? I mean, that's when you're in that space, good stuff will happen, you know, whether it happens on this project or that project, but it's that space. If you can combine that childlike mind space with experience, you become extremely powerful. And part of what is interesting to me about my life as an actor now that is different is like, I remember I was going on set a couple of years ago, I was playing John Brown and there were a lot of people on set that thought I was out of my mind, you know, that I was just, what is he doing? <laughs> and because I have so much experience about it, I just laugh. I didn't take their criticism seriously, or I knew that in order to do this dance, I have to walk right up to the edge of silliness, stupidity. But because I'm experienced, I don't think falling off the ledge makes me a bad actor. I know I'm a good actor. And that experience gives you confidence. And I think what's hard when you're young, whether you're not literally young, but young at the art form or young at what you're trying to do, you're worried that being bad means you can't do it, you know? And it doesn't. I mean, that's the joy for those of us who are parents of watching kids play. You want to be in that headspace where your imagination is just flowing. You don't have to be good at it. In a, in a way that even that desire to be good at it is, is an enemy. It's one of the things that Maya really loved about Flannery O'Connor. One of her uh, original hits was that Flannery was wise enough to be incredibly suspect of her ambition. You know, what is it in service of? Is it in service of me being fabulous? I don't want to spend my life trying to make other people think I'm fabulous. It has to be in service of the art form itself. Right. And in and, and, and service of others, that's when it feels really good. And then there is no failure because you, you are pushing the form. You are doing it. You're at play. So then everything becomes fun. It's just the commercial world is real. We all have bills. It's real. We want to get to do it again. I understand it all. It's finding some balance with your inner joy, your inner creativity and the discipline of being a good craftsperson and and working hard. Totally. Beautiful. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think you, you got to pay your mortgage or your rent and buy grocery, you know, and, but I think, yeah. <laughs> you know, it took me a long time to, to refine the balance to do, like I said, to just take on personal projects, to say yes to things that for a while I would have been like, I don't know, I'm busy. How much does it pay? Like this is, I've got a lot going on. And lately just saying, sure. Yeah, I'll do that. You know, like well, that, that's probably, that'd be good for me. L last question. I'll get you out of here. Cause I know we need to wrap it up, but I am curious. Cause I do, I have a lot of young filmmakers and photographers, but I have a lot of filmmakers that listen to this show. Do you remain hopeful as far as like the world of independent film? You know, like as we move into this more and more saturated world of kind of quote unquote content. And the only thing you see at the theater sometimes are like the biggest block. And look, I like blockbuster movies. They're great, but I, you know, it's, yeah, we all do. do you feel that there will always continue to be a, a good space for independent filmmaking? And, and what do you feel like that the advice you give to those people that are, that are chasing it? I don't know how you guys feel. Can I go first, Steve? I feel so grateful for Martin Scorsese at this exact moment. I'm so grateful that he's out there, the kind of lion in the field that he is, what he represents to people, what his work has accomplished. And he's, he's really being critical 
of words like content, the obsession with money. You know, there is a huge danger of becoming like McDonald's. You know, they, they've over 5 billion served equating with how much money something makes and how many people see it is qualifies as good. We've managed to turn everything about the arts into a competition. Even Rotten Tomatoes now gives you a score. <laughs> you, sure. you know, all, all this, they're turning everything into this quantifiable thing, which, which, dilute, which is, is bad for us. I, I remember when I was growing up, there would be prominent magazines that would do articles on off-Broadway plays. They were really championing avant-garde art, and, and it was being talked about like it was important. Patti Smith was important, you know, and it was the culture that was saying that. It wasn't like she was ever selling a trillion records, right? And I really appreciate Scorsese out there kind of leading that charge. The optimist in me thinks you can't stop human beings from communicating. Like the, the way the business works is always eating itself and then being reinvented, right? I, I feel like we are in a time period right now where it's never been easier to make a movie and it's never been harder to get your movie seen. You know, uh, people were so happy about Barbie and Oppenheimer. I was too. I am too. But there's still really big budget movies on really mainstream ideas, you know, Barbie and a bomb. It's hard. This idea of where are the fast spenders today? Is there a place for if your average blockbuster is 98 percent on Rotten Tomatoes, then what the hell is Fannie Alexander? I feel these days that, um, you know, I'm really inspired. I, I watch, uh, I, I stream movie. For me, movie is a place where I often see, you know, films that I don't see anywhere else. And I have other places that I'll find films. And I, I think there are still amazing indie films that are coming out there. And I'm always so thankful when they kind of, you know, scratch their way through all the other stuff. So I too feel like, I think it's still alive. I think it's still there. I think it's harder. And I also think, you know, a lot of young filmmakers are so influenced by what they're seeing on streamers, you know, mainstream streamers. So sometimes I'm, I'm frustrated by films that I feel like the language is too, um, they're not, they're not pushing the boundaries enough, you know? And so I wish there was more of that. I think, but I do think it's still out there. And I mean, I just, I just just think I, I started to cut you off, but I, I found myself, we were at Telluride with Wildcat, and I saw Vim Vendors there. I started thinking about my first experience at an art house movie theater, kind of one of my, I remember Wings of Desire came out, I don't know, I was 16 or something like that, went to this art house movie theater and saw that movie. And I was so blown away by the world of filmmaking that I didn't know about, you, you, you know, that everything wasn't Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like there was another language of ideas and that there were people out there making movies for grownups that were very difficult to understand. And kind of the way that I felt if you read Brothers Karamazov or something, you're like, oh, people are doing that with film. And that was so thrilling to me. And I do wonder if audiences were in this dance with our audiences and our culture, if they're not hungry to have that conversation then though these movies won't get made. Yeah. It, we're we're in we're in this dance together. Like, would people sit through Wings of Desire now? If it came out now, where would it get released? You, you know, it's it's very long. It's a lot of work to watch that movie and it's really rewarding. But the culture has to say, hey, watch this. Yeah. Let's talk about it later. You know, and there's so much that's so easy to watch and so fun. And we all enjoy it. I'm I like Scorsese says, I'm not here to badmouth anybody. Just saying to say we have to carve out space for an adult conversation or we all just start acting like juveniles. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, I think it it, it becomes that gambling, I guess, for the studios and stuff, you know, because the, I mean, that's the thing. Like you said, it's never been technology wise, it's never been easier to film something, you know, and to like get a story out there. But when you're talking about, making an independent film, then you're still talking about actors and, you know, lighting and grip. And I mean, it just, it gets expensive. So sure. If you're making a vlog or something, it's never been easier to tell a story and, and get it to a, a, a massive audience. But I think when it comes to really creating and crafting a beautiful art film, um, 
it, it, yeah, I would just wonder because I'm such a fan and, you know, and it makes me happy when you do see one that comes along every once in a while where you're like, oh, he, you know, like Wes Anderson still gets to do it or, you know, whoever it is. Like, yeah, but, <laughs> it's amazing. There's a few people that have, yeah. have carved this space, you know, Quentin, Wes yeah. Anderson, a few people have really managed to make cinema and make it mainstream. And I'm so grateful to them, you know, I know. I, I, yeah, I went and saw the Wes Anderson film the other night, and I was still, I was like, oh, like it's amazing that he, uh, you know, has been allowed, you know, because of what he does and the films he make that he's still making these films. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, it's it's breathtaking. Well, I want it to gives get, us all hope. I want to wrap it up, get you both out of here. I, but once again, I, you know, uh, thank you for letting me watch the movie first of all, and, and it turned out beautifully. I hope people will. We'll watch it. it. It's a it's a beautiful story. It's visually stunning. I hope you two keep working together because it really is. It's a it seems like a great um, artistic collaborative experience, and it's really just been it an honor to is. have you both on the show and, oh, and, yeah. and talk about this movie Wildcat. People go see it, and um, thank you so much for for taking time out for me. Thank oh, you, thanks, Rick. Appreciate yeah, it. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thank appreciate you so it a much. lot. And thank you even more so for being patient when everything failed on me. That was, that was me falling down. Like you were talking about falling down. I fell down hard. But you I, got, back, I got up. back up. I hope I, I hope I did okay, okay after that stress. So have a good right, one. Man. Thanks for watching the movie. Thanks for your time, Rick. Oh man. Yeah, I, thanks Rick. I, it was really a pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank, okay. you. thank you. Revolution. There was, what do you think? See what I'm saying? He's an inspiring dude. Beautiful film. Once again, go see it. Steve, Ethan, thank you. It was a real pleasure when I started a show out of my little studio in Colorado to talk about photography and filmmaking and visual arts. It would have never even crossed my mind that I would one day sit down and have conversations with someone like Ethan Hawke and all the other amazing artists that I've had on this show. It's just been an incredible journey that I hope to continue uh, and that I'm really focused on right now. And I will focus on through the winter. Like I said in the beginning, might have to take some summertime off. That might become a theme to this show. But as long as you guys can stick with me, I'll come back with great guests like this and great conversations that hopefully inspire you to uh, chase your creative dreams. Have the audacity to believe in yourself. That's where I'm going to leave it. That is it for another episode of the Visual Revolutionary Podcast. Thank you all for listening, for being fans of the show. I appreciate you all. I truly do. I'll be back soon for another episode. Until then, I'm out. Peace. Revolution.